Good evening all. Welcome to the December BTS presentation. I am delighted that this evening we have an update from Tideway and I would like to introduce our five speakers for this evening. Firstly, introducing the following speakers, we will have Andy Older. Andy is the Programme Director for Tideway as part of the Jacobs Programme Management Team and is responsible for the delivery of all infrastructure for the project. Andy joined the Tideway project in 2015 from Crossrail, where he was chief tunnel engineer during the detailed design phase, managed procurement of a number of tunneling contracts, and was project manager for construction of all tunneling work in the west area of Crossrail. He previously led design on the Tottenham Court Road LU station upgrade and DLR extension to Woolwich. Andy is a fellow of the Institution of Civil Engineers and a member of the ICE Council. He will be introducing Robbie Quinn. Robbie is Bar Hale's project manager for the Barn Elms project for the Tideway West JV of Bamnuttall, Morgan Sindel and Balfour Beatty. He is a chartered civil engineer and joined Bar Hale at the beginning of the year to help with the recovery of the pipe jack. Robbie has gained experience in underground construction from working on various projects in London and the South East, such as the Tottenham Court Road LU station upgrade, Farringdon station, Crossrail, Brighton Wastewater Treatment Works and the West Ham Flood Alleviation Scheme. This evening we will also have a presentation from Oscar Hueso. Oscar is the Deputy Tunnel Construction Manager for the Tideway Central JV of Ferrovial and Langerock and he is responsible for the delivery of the main tunnels B and C. Oscar joined the Tideway project in 2016 from Crossrail where he was Senior Tunnel Engineer during the delivery of the Western Tunnels. Oscar has previously been responsible for delivery of different sections of the new underground line 7 of Barcelona in Spain, where he participated in the implementation of the hyperbaric cuthead interventions for the first time in Spain. We will also have um, speaker of Mikel Martinez. Mikel is a TBM section engineer for the Tideway Central JV of Ferrovial and Langerock. For the last two years, he has been in charge of the main tunnel TBM production control. He joined for overall construction on the LBJ Express construction project in Texas, USA, and then on Crossrail during the Bond Street Station SEL works, where he was initiated in the tunneling industry. After that, he worked in the Silvertown Tunnel Tender as bidding engineer in charge of the estimation and procurement process before joining the Tideway project. This will be followed by a presentation from Shannon O'Keefe. Shannon is the senior agent for the Chambers Wharf site and main tunnel D as part of Tideway East, JV of Costain Limited, Vancey Construction Grands Projet and Bashi Solitanche. Shannon is a chartered engineer and member of both the Institution of Civil Engineers and the Civil College of the Institution of Engineers Australia. Shannon has over 12 years experience in Australia and the United Kingdom on major tunnelling infrastructure projects, including Airport Link in Brisbane, Australia, London Power Tunnels, Hinkley Point C Marine Works, and the Thames Tideway Scheme. So I'd like to now to introduce the first speaker, um, Andy Alder. Thank you very much, Kate, and um, good evening, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to be able to come and um, present an update on the Tideway project to you. So I um, hope, hope this is interesting, hope it's enjoyable. As Kate said, I'm going to give a general update of the project and then Robbie, Oscar, Mikhail and Shannon are going to give some more um, detailed, kind of short detailed presentations on three aspects of the project. Um, we, we could have picked any of the 21 sites to, to give the detailed presentations on, but these are kind of three which give a kind of indication of the variety of the work that's going on and, and some of the challenges that the team are, are dealing with. And then I'll wrap up at the end with a look ahead to what um, 2021 brings for us. So just to recap on, on the, what the Tideway project is, um, I'm sure most people notice it already, so I'll be quite brief. There's, there's 50 million tonnes of um, untreated sewage is currently going into the River Thames every year, which is obviously an, a, a, an environmental and a public health um, problem. And so the Thames Tideway Tunnel Scheme is the 25 kilometre long uh, tunnel project to, to intercept those flows and to take them away from the River Thames. Uh, so that once the, the if, if a storm comes through, the, the sewer overflows into the tunnel. And once the storm has passed, the sewage can get um, pumped out through the Beckton sewage treatment plant uh, and, and treated properly. 
And this is an example of, of one of the shafts. This is the one at, at Victoria Embankment opposite the London Eye. And you can see on the right hand side, Basil Gates low level number one sewer, an interception structure that, that connects to the sewer. Uh, then that, that takes the sewage into our, into our shaft. In this case, about 45 meters deep, where it then connects into, into our main tunnel. And this is uh, fairly typical of the way the system works at all of the combined sewer overflow sites. Uh, each one has its own own challenges, but that kind of gives an indication of, of the system. Just before we get into the presentation proper, um, to start on a health, safety, and well-being moment. Um, and if you if you were here last year at, at Great George Street for the presentation, I talked about the award scheme that we're using to um, to, to share and to recognise the best practice that's being de developed and delivered on each of the sites. Um, so here's just a couple of other examples of some of the things that we're using, which I think are fundamental to the health and safety approach that we've that we've got on on Tideway. So the first of those is readiness reviews. Before we start any um, high risk or safety critical activity, there's a thorough readiness review, which is a collaborative approach between um, the mainworks contractors, specialist contractors, designers, uh, the project management team to make sure we've we've looked at, reviewed, and, and are happy with every aspect of the work before it starts. And that will include personnel, competency, design, consents, the kind of overall methodology, um, and, and it's and I think it's been very useful in getting you know really high level of rigor into the planning of work. Back in March, we we stopped work across most of the sites for about three weeks um, when the COVID situation um, uh, came across to the UK, and we used again the readiness review process to review uh, our our preparations and our safety arrangements, our health arrangements for restarting work on site um, in in the COVID working, um, you know, working through the COVID situation. So. It, it, it's been a very useful tool, I think, in getting um, health and safety right through the planning. The other thing we do is, you know, recognise that things don't always go to, to plan. Um, and we have a an incident review process, which we use for, for uh, you know, incident, health and safety incidents um, near misses, where we think there's learning that needs to be understood and shared. And there's, there's a few things about this, which I think are really important. The, the first is that this is a um, collaborative, no blame um, approach. You know, culture. We've got to get the culture right so that people are happy to share things that didn't go to plan, uh, and we can understand it and learn from it without people feeling um, uh, uncomfortable about sharing that. We have a, the first review takes place within 24 hours of an incident occurring to see is there something we know now that we need to do to stop recurrence, and then there's a, a, a full review with with actions and lessons learned that come out of that. Typically, seven days later. But I think the key thing here is is to make sure that we're we're all learning together, um, with without that kind of fear of blame or or criticism. Just to say, you know, that we're, we're all human. Let's learn and 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 help others learn from the same things. So I'm going to talk through progress in for the main tunnels and then onto these the CSO shafts. So starting in the, in the west, the west contract, which is the the BAM Morgan um, Morgan Sindel and and Balfour Beatty joint venture. I've got the West Main Tunnel and the Frogmore Connection Tunnel. Uh, earlier in the year, in, in July, the Frogmore Connection Tunnel TBM finished it, its drive, and so that, that completed that work. You can see the TBM breaking through in the top right of the picture, while the main tunnel um, excavation is still going on in, in the bottom of the shaft. The team then continued onto the secondary lining for Frogmore Connection Tunnel, and, and half of the, the Frogmore Connection Tunnel secondary line is, is now complete to, to, to an excellent quality standard. Um, quite, quite confined working through the COVID period, so the team had to put a fair amount of work into getting the, the social distancing to work and the right controls in place. And on the main tunnel in West, in September, main tunnel A, TB and Rachel broke through into the Acton shaft, and the team are in the process now of removing the TBM uh, to then allow the secondary line to start in main tunnel A. Moving across to central then, we've got two main tunnels in central, the main tunnel B and main tunnel C. The main tunnel T TBM finished about a year ago. The main tunnel C TBM uh, is the one that passed right through from, um, from Battersea up to Chambers Wharf of Bermondsey underneath Tower Bridge, which was in September this year, obviously uh, a fair amount of um, asset protection assessments and monitoring in place on that bridge, the same as any other structure. But this one was a pretty iconic structure to be tunneling underneath. But that was very successfully done. 
And then a couple of weeks ago, it broke into the shaft at Chambers Wharf, completing that drive, which went as, as Oscar and Mikel will talk through some of the challenges of that drive, but, but um, pretty tricky ground conditions for that TBM. As I'm sure you're aware, we're using marine logistics for, for all of our tunneling work um, on the main tunnel. So muck, muck away and segment delivery, which has been very successful. Marine, uh, the marine industry has done a, done a great job for us. Uh, we've now moved 4 million tonnes by river, which is coming up to 500,000 lorry movements taken off from the streets, obviously with, with huge health and safety benefits as well as environmental benefits. Uh, and, and, and we're really pleased with how the marine logistics has gone on the project. And then main tunnel B, the, the secondary line of main tunnel B is just starting up now. Um, uh, first few ports have gone in. Again, it's going, it's, you know, lot, lots of things to come together to make that work, but the first few ports have gone uh, uh, looking really good. Uh, and I'm sure this will be a presentation for uh, another year's time to talk through the secondary lining piece of the project. And then on in the East contract, so that, so that was the central contract, which is the Ferrovia Langer Rock joint venture. In the East contract, which is the Costa and Vancy Abashi joint venture, there's the main tunnel D and the Greenwich Connection tunnel. And we're just in the process of launching the, the two TBMs there, which um, Shannon will talk about uh, in, in his presentation. Away from the main tunnels on the CSO shafts, then we have got there's 23 shafts across the project. 21 of those shafts are now excavated and the base slabs complete. These are the two that we, we finished just around kind of April, May. Um, this year, just uh, as as we got back to work after COVID, the connection tunnels between the main sh between the shaft and the main tunnel. There's eight connect. There's ten connection tunnels. Uh, a mix of pipe jacking um, and spray concrete lining work. Eight of those. Eight of the ten are now complete. Uh, and and Robbie will talk about one of those at, at Barn Elms that he's been um, working on. And then we're in, in going ahead with um, secondary lining in, in the shafts and, and the connection tunnels that's happening across the program now. And then just to kind of final progress update uh, you, for anyone who was here on the um, for the meeting last December where we gave an update. Um, John Chu gave a, an update on the work of Blackfriars and the, the work to float the culvert structure. Um, which was cast in this casting basin in the middle of the slide and then towed into place, floated and towed into place underneath the Blackfriars Bridge to, to make the connection to the Blackfriars Bridge. So it was cast there in the casting basin and then floated and towed into place. Um, and then in the August bank holiday, so obviously a very um, innovative piece of work. In the August bank holiday weekend this year, that, that work came to its culmination um, and the, the culvert was successfully floated up uh, and towed into place and set down underneath Blackfriars Bridge and the team are now on the case building the in situ structures between this floated culvert and the main shaft. So that looks like a pretty innovative piece of work which was successfully completed in, in August. So I'm going to hand over now to, to Robbie and then um, th then it'll be Mikel and Oscar and then Shannon. So Robbie's going to talk about the, the connection tunnel at Barn Elms in, in the West contract. Uh, Mikkel and Oscar are going to talk about main tunnel C and particularly the hyperbaric um, interventions and then Shannon will talk through um, the, the work to launch main tunnel D. So with that I will pass over to Robbie. Thank you Randy and uh, good evening everyone. Um, so I'm Robbie Quinn, the Barhead project manager over at Barn Arms and uh, this evening I'll talk to you about the connection tunnel and the the challenges we faced with our pipe jack. Um, so just quickly, where, where is Barn Elms? It's uh, between Hammersmith Bridge and Putney Bridge on the south side of the river. And in terms of what we're dealing with in our in our immediate environment, um, it looks like a green greenfield site, but um, as you can imagine, on such a big project, you're subject to the development consent orders that, and have interfaces with uh, the local authorities. Port of London Authority, Thames Water, um, and the, the sports fields, and uh, the EEA, of course, as we were quite close to the river there. You can see an aerial shot of the site footprint there in the bottom right, and um, in the top right, an architecture representation of what we leave behind us. So, just an overview of, of the scope that we have to deliver. Um, we're, we are going to break into uh, the West Putney Storm Relief Sewer and divert that flow through a series of chambers into a 30 meter deep 
uh, drop shaft and then out along our connection tunnel to the main tideway tunnel under the Thames. Um, we've got a number of uh, shallow underground structures um, with the air treatment chamber with some activated carbon filters for, for air that comes out of the shaft um, when, the, when the tunnel is operational um, and some chambers housing pen stocks and flat bulbs. Uh, we also have a mechanical electrical kiosk on the surface as well. And from the photos, you can see the current progress at the moment. Uh, we've built our mechanical electrical kiosk. Uh, we've completed our connection tunnel. Um, our shaft is complete, obviously. And uh, this is just an aerial shot of showing you what the chambers look like before we put the roof on. So our connection tunnel, uh, it's just over 200 meters long and a relatively large pipe for a pipe jack, so three meter OD. We used an open face machine um, and it was uh, excavated through London clay. Um, we started the pipe jack, so the, just before I arrived on the project, the, the team had, had started on 31st of January. They identified some cracks in the pipes um, shortly thereafter. Uh, the pipe jack was stopped on the 7th of February uh, following significant cracking in nine of the 11 pipes that were installed. So the tunnel was about 30 meters long um, by the time we'd stopped. Um, the cracks were longitudinal cracks at approximately four and 10 o'clock facing the, the direction of the tunnel. And some of the cracks had, um, had extended up to two millimeters in width and we had some minor spalling as well. Now, uh, just to preempt any questions about the causes, um, the cause of the failure of the pipes is still under review and the outcome of which is, is, is considered commercially sensitive. So I won't be able to discuss the, the causes of the cracks. Um, uh, instead, I'd like to focus on the challenge we faced and how we overcame that challenge. So the, the recovery strategy, you know, just, what were we trying to achieve? We, we, we knew we needed to replace um, the nine defective pipes. So I mentioned that there were 11 pipes were installed. We had two pipes that had not yet reached the ground. They, they were within our, our SCL adit. Um, so we, we, we had to pull those out. They were, they were recoverable and uh, we had to replace the, the nine defective pipes and, uh, and relaunch our machine to complete the connection tunnel. So the tunnel was stationary for, for five months. Um, so the ground was, was tight around our pipeline. We expected that the recovery operation would be a slow process. So uh, in the, de the development of um, a shield uh, to, to go in and, and remove the pipes, we wanted to create a, a larger opening around, a larger opening in the ground to slide our new pipes through. Um, the focus was on picking a method to reach the machine and allow us to, to, to relaunch and continue. Um, our concrete lead pipe within our, our machine that was uh, effectively stationary in the ground was, was severely damaged. So we had to remove that. Now, the lead time for casting another uh, concrete lead pipe um, was, was too too long. Uh, so we, we decided to go with a steel, to fabricate a steel segmental pipe that you can see in photo two there. Um, this is the shield as it arrived on site. So the idea was that we would launch the shield. It would, um, we, we put a brock in the tunnel in by of the work area and we would separate each pipe into four sections, so four 625 mil sections, or, or rings rather. Um, and then we would attack each ring with the brock um, sequentially. So we would break, break the crown, shove the shield forward, and the shield was designed with this hood to protect the, the workforce from unsupported ground by pushing the new pipes in behind. And the idea with the, the steel lead pipe would, was then, once we reached the machine, this steel lead pipe would go, would dock, we would take this hood out, remove the hood, and dock the steel lead pipe and continue with our pipe check. So it was important for us to, to develop a method that would minimize or eliminate altogether manual handling, the creation of dust and noise, and protect the workforce from that unsupported ground when the crown comes down at these rings. So, um, so there were two pipes, like I mentioned, the SCL added, which had not, which had not yet reached the ground. So you can see in photo one, that's that's what we were left with once we removed the two pipes that could be recovered. Then we started the circumferential cuts to divide the pipes um, into four sections each. Uh, we brought the brock into the tunnel. You can see where the brock was positioned there in, in photo four. Um, and uh, we, we got ready to launch the machine. Just before... Um, 
uh, taking on the, the breaking of the crown, we, we separated each ring into four, four more sections. So with the longitudinal cuts at uh, three, six, nine, and 12, roughly. So two cuts just below axis and one cut just off center in the crown. This allowed us to break a wedge with the rock and get the crown, get the crown or shoulder pieces into the invert where they could be removed once the shield was pushed forward to, to protect the, the workforce from that uns unsupported ground. Um, once the shield is up, then the, the guys can go in, get rid of the, the crown pieces, and then start to work, to work on the invert pieces to, to remove those to pit bottom as well. And that's the, that was the sequence of work. So it was like four, four longitudinal cuts separated into four sections, break the wedge and the crown, take the pieces down into the invert and pull them back to pit bottom as you move the shield forward with your new pipes behind. Um, and uh, the brock was operated, the brock was operated from pit bottom side. So you can see in photo two, you've got a steel pipe here that would protect the umbilicals for the, for the brock, which allowed us to, to keep anybody out of the work area. There was no, no need for the, the, the operatives to be in that work area while we were breaking out. Um, everything could be done from pit bottom side. And as you can appreciate, the brock was positioned there. It might look a bit strange. Positioned there to, to, so as not to impede our, our, um, the route for removal of the segments once we broke them. So it went, uh, we were, it went quite, we were quite successful in the end. Um, it took us two and a half weeks to reach our machine. So once we got to the machine, we removed our damaged lead pipe, our concrete lead pipe. Um, once we did that, the tail skin of our machine deformed more than was originally measured because the ground loading was significant. Um, to, to combat this, we, we relaunched our machine, so started the TV, connected the TEM up and started to move forward. And we followed it uh, in a, a dual advanced sequence with the recovery shield. This allowed us to move the, the mach our, our machine, which had been in ground for five months, forward into virgin ground. And um, it, allowed, it allowed the tail skin a chance to almost rebound to its original shape, which permitted us to, to remove the, the hood and, and dock the, 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 concrete, the steel lead pipe. So you can see in photo three, that's the, the segmental steel lead pipe. It's docked in the back of the machine. Um, and then photo two, you can see the squeeze that the ground was, was giving our um, tail skin. It was um, significant and, and more than we had expected. Um, so all in all, it took 17 weeks to plan, um, develop a design and fabricate this re recovery shield and, uh, and come up with the best way of doing it. Um, the replacement once we started took two and a half weeks, so it went to, went went very well. Um, and then once we relaunched the machine, it was five weeks to the end. And the main challenge then to complete the the tunnel were, were was managing the jacking loads. We had a, a pretty pretty tight jacking limit on the thrust wall in the shaft, um, and it, it mandated the use of three interjacks uh, rather than the two that we had originally planned for this for this drive. Um, the jacking loads got got uh, to such a you know, got to such a level um, for the last three weeks. Um, we had to run with three gangs, so we were, we were running pretty much twenty four seven for the last three weeks of the drive to manage those jacking loads. So what what was interesting about it, I suppose, is despite the increase in the annulus that we 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 provided the the, ton, the pipes behind the recovery shield. And the time that it was stationary, it just squeezed so much that uh, we had to live with those hijacking loads right to the end. So effectively, just outside the shaft of that first 30 meters where the pipeline was, was stationary for five months, um, we, we struggled really to shake those jacking loads. Um, and we had to live with it to the end. Now in terms of settlement, um, the long term settlement is still within the allowable limits. Uh, we had a maximum 40 mil settlement on the river wall. Uh, which has since rebounded to about 28 millimeters, um, and the amber trigger for that asset, just for example, it was, was 75 millimeters, so quite a distance from the from the amber trigger. Um, but um, pleasing to finish it all the same and, and get to the main tunnel, um, and that was completed on the 16th of September. Now, just to 
I suppose some things that we, we developed on site, uh, some the engineers are developed on site um, to make our lives easier and just to show that uh, we're constantly thinking of how to minimize or eliminate risk. Um, uh, we developed this lifting beam, which some of you might have seen before, but uh, I personally hadn't. Um, you see a lifting beam with wheels on it, so it can be lowered on one side of the pipe and pass through the invert, roll along the invert and be connected. And it eliminates the need to get up on the on the wagon to, to access the lifting point, which is typically on top of these pipes. And as I said before, they're quite large pipes, three meters diameter. Um, again, to eliminate working overhead, we use these uh, simple pipe rollers. Um, place the pipe, especially for kitting out a, an interjack with heavy rams, 16 heavy rams that need to go in and be fit on site. Um, you just roll the pipe around and you're constantly working in the invert rather than working overhead. Very, very simple ideas, but um, very, very effective. Um, so that's it from me. Um, I'm happy to take any questions following the other presentations. And I, I just like to, to say um, that I'm here representing a, a team of people that have been working tirelessly for the last 11 months at Barnhams. Very proud to be part of the team. Very young team as well. There's only two of us out of eight that are over the age of 30, and and there's young engineers who have learned a lot. And often you, you of course, is a, I'm sure you'd agree, you learn the most when when things go wrong. And um, incredible, incredibly resilient bunch here at um, Barnhams. I'll hand over to Oscar and Michael now. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay, thanks, Kate, Andy, and Robbie. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's, it's Oscar Wessel speaking, and with Mikel Martinez, uh, we are going to talk about how we manage our hyperbaric cutterhead interventions. I will do a short introduction to our drive, location, geology, and cutterhead intervention strategy, followed by Mikel that will talk about how we executed the hyperbaric interventions. Uh, the main channel C is located in the central section of the Way project with a length of 7.6 kilometers. We use a TBM EPB of almost 9 meters of diameter. Uh, the tunnel starts at Kirlin Street, close the, to the Battersea Power Station, and follows the layout of the Thames up to Chambers Wharf. The tunnel grows very close of some of the most iconic places of central London, as the House of Parliament, London Eye, and we have gone under five London underground tunnels and night bridges, including the famous tower bridge as Andy mentioned. If it was not enough complexity going under those assets, which implied excessive and volume loss restrictions, we had an heterogeneous ground. We mined through clay, sand, shelly beds, sandstones, gravels, and chalk. Uh, summarizing the geotechnical profile, a uh, first section of six kilometers uh, through Lambert Group, that is mainly clay with sandstone layers and channels of sand with gravel, followed by 1.2 kilometers with high percentage of deface in tunnel sands ending in the chalk, the last 400 meters. Our geotechnical baseline report remarks a risk of high pressure of the water in all those strata with a maximum of 5.3 bars under the tunnel sands. Adding to the challenge of this high pressure water, the geotechnical information also highlights the abrasiveness of the ground from medium to high. Therefore, good planning of the cutterhead interventions will be required and a high likelihood to be in hyperbaric conditions. The following pictures show some examples how the abrasion has affected our cutting tools. To identify the areas of the potential hyperbaric interventions, uh, we had the support of OTV Engineering. They produced a map of our drive where those interventions could be located. Uh, for the aim of this presentation, we have summarized in free air the sections in green, hyperbaric in red, and the areas where regarding of the ground conditions, free air or hyperbaric could happen, the yellow sections. At the end, we managed to do the first five kilometers in free air from Kirlin Street to Graffriars, leaving the crossing of the Tanet Sands as the only section where hyperbaric interventions were required. As I mentioned, uh, we have been able to do the first kilometers in free air, 
that has been possible doing a preliminary analysis before the intervention occurs. Uh, we're gathering all the geotechnical information available and we did an assessment of the TBM parameters. The key indicator for us of those TBM parameters was the additives to the head, the free water and the foam that we had to condition in the, the spoil. Uh, a trending increase of those parameters indicates that we are going uh, a dry ground and the chances to execute the intervention in free air higher. Once selected the location and before entering to the head, uh, we did a recharge test to evaluate if there is or not a flow of water coming through the ground. If there was not, uh, we proceed with the free air. If the flow of the water was manageable, we use our TBM dewatering system to keep the level of the water below the working area. Occasionally, we had also used resins to seal minor water ingress and carry on with intervention safely. As, as a summary, in 7.6 kilometers, we conducted uh, nine interventions in free air, three in hyperbaric, and I can see that all of them executed safely and successfully. And now Mikkel is gonna explain with more detail or hyperbaric intervention. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Kate. So, hyperbaric interventions. What, why, and how? Hyperbaric intervention means raising the pressure above atmospheric in the excavation chamber to perform a repair or maintenance of the TBM cutterhead. The geotechnical principles under it are to ensure the ground stability in case of uh, non-cohesive soil and or groundwater is present. And it is accomplished by, pre by pressurizing the TBM excavation chamber and ensuring its airtightness in the, the interface between the, the machine and the, and the ground by the bentonite cake, the tailskin seal, and the TBM systems. Here we want to share with you an explanatory video about the hyperbaric procedure you can see the TBM airlock systems with the entry, the main, and the working locks. Firstly, the excavation chamber and the working lock will be pressurized at intervention pressure, as you can see in the video, the iron the green. The hyperbaric team will then enter the main lock where the compression will take place in between three to five minutes, depending on the working pressure. At this point, they have to equalize and open the locks to access the cutter head. Then during the intervention, you can see that the entry lock is not being pressurized. This is used as part of our emergency procedure. In case the, the medical DMLA is the medical lock attendants, they need to enter to assist medically the, the hyperbaric team. And once the, the maximum working time in the in the cutter head is reached, intervention team comes back to, to main lock for the decompression process. The deco will be done in stages. Well, now you are seeing they are going to the main lock. And as I was saying, the deco will be done in stages depending on the intervention pressure. For example, they will be decompressed up to one bar when the oxygen masks, as you can see there, the oxygen mask briefing will start to facilitate decompression until atmospheric pressure is reached and intervention is finished. Some pictures of the TBM lock systems. Here another video to bring you closer to our TBM cutter head during a hyperbaric intervention. An extra effort is definitely required to work in the cutter head, which is even greater under compressor. The human body feels the pressure in terms of energy needed to make any effort, as you also need to counteract the, the environment pressure. Then there are two types of hyperbaric interventions depending on the pressure. Below 3.45 bar, known as normal hyperbaric with air breathing, during the process and oxygen supply during deco. Above 3.45 bar is the mixed gas interventions, which requires an exemption letter by HSC. Flow gain it, probably a line or hook, uh, gain it, which was a massive achievement. And uh, also the initial ground investigation indicated pressures between 3.5 to 4 bars in the last two kilometers after London Bridge faulting area in the Tanet Sands and Chalk. Therefore, project allocated resources to be prepared for, for that. Here you can see the main difference between normal deco masks on the left and the trimix umbilical mask on the right with the, with the comm system to give them assistance during intervention given the complexity of the operation. 
in terms of personal selection and logistics, an extensive effort was made by Flo. Firstly, related to the personal selection process with the assistance of TRHA, a strict medical supervision of workforce was put in place with the medical doc attendants, the MLAs, and the doctor to declare any participant fit for hyperbaric before any intervention. The medicals were completed with theoretical and practical training given to a group of 30 men with no previous hyperbaric ex experience. They were trained on the regulation, responsibilities, procedures, health risks, equipment, protocols, uh, etc. And secondly, a huge logistic plan was delivered as per UK compressor regulation in 96 with three surface compressor, two tunnel airlines, and the oxygen and trimix stock on surface. And finally, the surface uh, medical lock, medical lock uh, shown on pictures above, was allocated in Kirlin Street to treat any decompression illness and avoid the travel time to, to the nearest hyperbaric facilities, which were in the St. George Hospital. As you can see, the UK regulation differs from others, such as the German, where the TBN compressor can be used, or the Spanish, where only divers can be employed for catastrophic interventions. How the hyperbarics were managed in Taiwan Central? As shown here, in the hyperbaric organigram, there was a compressor coordinator leading the monthly committee with hyperbaric specialists, TRHA, production team, plant department, and health and safety. There were weekly meetings to follow up the TBM performance, next plan intervention, equipment maintenance plan, and personal medicals. And in terms of intervention management, the MLAs from TRHA trained the workforce, as we explained before, but they also completed the, the permit to enter and they operated the hyperbaric equipment. In parallel, Oscar and myself, we prepared an, an action plan to train all the SIF engineers and SIF managers into the hyperbarics as they will be the delegated to complete the permit to enter and also supervise the, the intervention procedure, but also the parameters such as uh, Samsung valves or, and the cake stability itself. Another strong tool was the real-time data monitoring all the staff in the hyperbaric team had access to in their smartphones, since this was a 24-7 critical operation. To summarize some of the hyperbaric project figures, three interventions in compressed air have been performed, totaling more than 100 hyperbaric cycles, with a pressure, as you can see, from 1.6 to 3 bar, in different ground conditions from abnormal formation gravels to full phase tunnel sands before tower bridge, challenging ground to ensure cake stability, requiring different volumes and a slurry concentration, and two complete set of tools changed in first and second intervention. We also we would like to share with you an example of best practice related to hyperbaric in Taiwan Central. In February 2019, Ursula reached Blackfriars soft uh, footprint after five kilometers completed. At that point, the, the most difficult ground conditions were waiting for us. For that reason, we decided to perform a, a hyperbaric trial. And that included the bentonite cake, the compressor bubble injection, and the bubble monitoring. The outcome was an stable air bubble at 0 0.7 bar during seven days. And although the geological condition with clay presence were not representative, the lessons we learned were key for our future success. For example, the continuity on the caking process is crucial for its effectivity. However, ensuring the supply of that thicker slurry by pumping it to five to seven kilometers through our grout lines was not possible. As a consequence, uh, we used six remixers uh, to transport it. This also turned to be beneficial for the slurry properties in order to pre-store it before injection. And finally, the TBM systems. We proved all the TBM system and we adjust the, the injection rate to the batching plant rate using the, especially the foam lines, treating directly the phase, which was uh, beneficial. And to conclude with the factors driving flow to this success, firstly, the company support. Although this has been the first hyperbaric intervention in UK for both companies, it wasn't the first time for Ferrovial. And besides this, they have supported this process with critical resources as the technical department or TRHA and by giving confidence to our team from the beginning. Secondly, the multidisciplinary team in charge with hyperbaric experience and a key TBM operative selection process leading this operation. 
innovative, innovative solutions, implemented as cake additives and phase stabilization, working closely with, uh, for example, TNL18 or Ateglob. Critical high risk activity managed during a pandemic, achieving high health and safety standards. Uh, technological solutions to manage intervention, as mentioned before. And the most important one, team endeavor as, with determination to deliver this milestone from ship engineers, TBM operatives, and, and staff. Thanks for your attention and a special thanks to BTS, Taiwei, Ferrovial Construction, Line Rook, OTB Engineering, TRHA, TNL18, and our amazing workforce. Thank you. Thank you very much. A sec here, everyone. Obviously, technical issues on my side. There's always got to be one. So, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, um, and thank you to Oscar and Mikael, Robbie, uh, Andy, and Kate. Uh, my name's Shannon O'Keefe. I'm the senior agent for CVB uh, on Tideway East for Main Tunnel D and Chambers Wharf. Um, tonight, I'm going to be talking to you about the delivery and uh, ready to bore for Selena, uh, a TBM that's doing the main tunnel D drive from Chambers Wharf to Abbey Mills. Uh, just a few key facts for everyone. So uh, on the right hand side of the map, we are driving the TBM from uh, item number 17, which is Chambers Wharf site, up the Thames River towards the Limehouse Cut, and then along the Limehouse Cut to the Abbey Mills pumping station, where it connects into the Lee Tunnel. Uh, the drive is 5.5 kilometres long, mainly through chalk, uh, but we do expect some uh, geotechnical hazards where we may get faces of uh, Thanet Sands and Lambeth Group. Uh, we intercept a connection at the King Edward Memorial Park about a third of the way along our journey. Uh, the TBM is a Heron Connect mixed shield type, that is a slurry TBM. Uh, the shield uh, weighs a circa 800 tonnes, uh, combined with its 112 metre length uh, of gantries and shield is about 1,500 tonnes. In terms of the opportunities, risks and challenges that we, we faced, obviously being the furthest east site, we're not as height restricted as, as central and west um, with the immediate bridge to our west being Tower Bridge. Uh, that meant that we had an opportunity to deliver the full shield and gantries to launch the TBM. Uh, in the same way that that's an opportunity that presents a lot of challenges and risks in that it makes it a very technically and logistically complicated uh, delivery. Add into that the small working site that we have at Chambers Wharf uh, and a slurry machine um, requiring a lot more technical backup uh, and an umbilical system to launch it. We then also looked at uh, a bespoke launch reaction system that we needed to construct as part of being able to push the TBM to break ground and then many, many more challenges that we discovered uh, along the way. So TBM delivery. Uh, when I joined the project, there were still two options sitting on the table for delivering the TBM. And that was using the Skylift 3000, which is a bespoke 3000 tonne jack-up barge based in Holland. The other one was a Matador 3, which is a heavy marine crane barge. Now, the Matador 3 had previously been used in the offloading of the TBM at Sheedam, where it sat before being brought to Chambers Wharf. And that's demonstrated in the top right picture. We did discuss this with Mamut, who were the delivery contractor, uh, and they did provide a scheme design, as you can see in the bottom two uh, pictures. Uh, however, Early on in the stage of discussions with the Port of London Authority, uh, the Marine Management Organisation and the Environment Agency, this was discounted as uh, the anchorage zones would actually limit the amount of river traffic that could pass by whilst we were undertaking the works. Uh, and unfortunately, the PLA were only interested in permitting this works to occur at night. So this was shelved. This meant that we went with the Skylift 3000 option. Uh, this led to a significant consultation consenting period that started uh, at the back end of last year, culminating with the delivery uh, during summer. We had very detailed uh, interactions with the Port of London Authority, the Marine Management Organisation, the Environment Agency, as well as our local borough of Southwark and others along the route of delivery, such as London City Airport, the Thames Barrier through the EA and the Emirates Airline. Obviously, if you think about the Skylift 3000 with its um, spuds in the air, there was a concern of the flight path coming into London City. There was a concern for the passing Emirates airline uh, and the width of the skylift itself going through the Thames barrier, necessitating at least two tugs to manoeuvre and bring the delivery up to Chambers Wharf. Once at Chambers Wharf, we then faced a number of significant temporary works hurdles. Uh, the delivery itself and the positioning of the barge was a tidally restricted activity. 
um, concerning one, the flow of the tides to position the barge, and two, some height restrictions uh, laid in with the height of our gantry crane structure that sits over the river. We then had consideration of the jack up of the barge and, and installing the spud legs into the riverbed itself, and then later removal of those spud legs. And of course, our delivery contractors, unique bits of work to lift and shift such a heavy load from a river vessel onto land. So when I talk about height restrictions and tides, as you can see by the picture on the right and the sequence demonstrated on the left, we needed to wait for a slack low tide before we could position the sky lift to ensure that there was no collisions between the structure and the spuds. Uh, for reference, there was about a metre, a metre and a half space between the spuds and the gantry structure itself when it was brought in. We then also had to get the jacking position set and the sky lift lifted into the air prior to the commencement of the next high tide, as at the final offload position, the height differential between the top of the TBM shield and our gantry crane was less than 250 mils. These works were intricately planned, controlled, um, and a lot of advice was sought by the PLA during the time when we did it. Uh, and at our assistance, the delivery contractor uh, installed a real-time or a kinetic or RTK system to ensure the accurate positioning of the spud legs during installation. Another important part of the delivery was a flood defence um, maintenance to the site. Um, the piles that we used to provide the cofferdam of Chambers Wharf provided that flood defence to the entire site and obviously to this part of London. However, the height of the sky lift and the ramp that was eventually used to drive the TBM off necessitated us to cut a gate into the cofferdam, which we affectionately now know as Selena's Gate. Uh, we needed to continue to maintain the flood defence not only during the use of the gate, but then after repositioning of the gate um, and the installation of it, it needed to be easily constructed, easily removed, easily reinstated, and it needed to be done so even in an emergency situation. Uh, the TBM delivery, so jacking of the barge and spud legs. Um, there were a number of technical challenges as well as um, considerations that we, we, we needed to work through again with our consenting organisations. Uh, the risk of encountering a UXO, so we had to re-undertake a UXO survey in this area to ensure that where the spud legs went in, there was no chance of intercepting one. We had to be considerate of archaeology. There was an archaeological survey done during construction of the coffer dam, however, we went further out into the river than had been envisaged. We then had to review the bearing capacity that we expected for the barge versus the penetration depth. So you can imagine with clay, you're going to get a development length, uh, and there was some concern that the spuds may have to go further into the river bed than anticipated. Uh, there was then retraction post works and in an emergency situation, how quickly could we get the spud legs out of the river um, without causing undue uh, damage to the riverbed? And then there was consideration of the backfilling or leave as is, and that actually proved to be the biggest challenge um, of the lot with the Marine Management Organisation uh, and the EA uh, wanting us to backfill the holes and the PLA not wanting us to backfill the holes, um, which led to a compromise of backfilling the two closest holes to the coffer dam and leaving the two furthest holes unbackfilled. And the decision to that came down to an interface between our permanent works designer of the coffer dam um, and the temporary works designer of the coffer dam in its current performance. The last bit, obviously, is Mamut's lift and shift. Um, they are the experts at what they do, and as you can see by these pictures, they do tend to push the envelope to its maximum. Um, standing next to it as it rolled off and looking at a very thin structure bend and bow as much as it did is, is quite an interesting experience but um, their design and their, their ability to off offload the TPM is, is second to, to none and we're very privileged to have been able to work with them to do this. And the one thing that, that we haven't mentioned a lot in any of the other presentations is is the COVID impact that we had on the works. Um, in total Chambers Wharf was probably stood down for about three to four weeks so originally planned uh, works were that the SEL would be completed in both the reception of Main Tunnel C and our launch added of Main Tunnel D, and then Selena would be delivered. However, because of the COVID impact and our change of works, we uh, had to deliver Selena at the same time as still completing the tunnels. Uh, it was a monumental task, but it was well achieved by our SEL teams and by the TBM teams to be able to facilitate these two activities at the same time. So now the TBM lowering. Uh, the lowering itself, again, another Mammut activity uh, and tried and tested system of using a strand jacking system. Uh, we were limited a bit with some of our site constraints, such as the restricted working space within the acoustic shed that we needed, uh, an angled alignment of the tunnel, uh, whereas sometimes when a TBM is lowered, 
they generally tend to use an alignment that's straight onto the system. Uh, and obviously resequencing of the works due to um, additional temporary works considerations because of SCL works not finishing as, as originally anticipated. So the best that we could do was to maximize the site constraints. So we integrated the use of our overhead gantry cranes that were built into the acoustic shed to install a lot of the strand jacking system. We also configured the strand jacking system to suit uh, to suit the installation alignment, which meant we could still traverse the TBM and the jacking system uh, across the shaft um, parallel to the alignment of the shed, but maintain the angle uh, of installation. Uh, the additional temporary works considerations, when the shaft was lined with its permanent lining, it was done using a double-sided slip form system. Uh, yeah. And after installation of that, an annulus grouting uh, operation was undertaken behind the lining. Unfortunately, that operation had not finished by the time the delivery came around, which meant there was a three to three and a half metre deep section behind the permanent lining of the shaft that did not have an annulus grout fill behind it. That then brought about some concern from Mott McDonald's, our permanent works designer, about the linings, lining concrete's structural stability and capability to take such a, a heavy transient load as the TBM was moved over it. Uh, so we had significant interface between OTB, our temporary works designer, Mont McDonald, our permanent designer, and Mamut to come up with a system that worked and would allow it. What we decided was the best approach was to drill an anti-bursting system, as you can see by the three dowels below the, the pot bearing jacks, um, and that alleviated the concerns and allowed Mont McDonald to sign off the lifting of the TBM. So in late August, uh, after a 15 hour operation that started very early in the morning, TBM Selena uh, and the 900 tons or so of, of her and her frame were lowered down into the shaft. Moving on to TBM assembly and launch, which is the current phase we're in. Um, it can be broken up into six steps, um, rudimentarily as I put them here, which is installing the launch added furniture. That is putting your slide rails, your pushing consoles, the slurry seal, which is required in the case of a slurry machine, uh, and some inflatable grout bags as part of the steel can, which I come on to. Uh, assembly and commissioning of gantries one and two. So the minimum that we required behind the TBM in order to launch it was gantries one and two, along with a number of umbilicals and other items for gantries three and four. Uh, installing and commissioning the services, the umbilicals and the launch support systems, which I'll come on to in a bit. And then of course, launching and burying the shield. Uh, as part of doing all this, we, we conducted 3D and 4D modeling, um, as well as doing cinematics to prove that we could, we could undertake the launch. Um, and this is an example of, of one of the, the, the time shots that we did from that. I think back in Andy's presentation earlier on this evening, he had one from Greenwich. So it was something that was employed across both TBM drives in East. So I talked about a launch reaction system. It's affectionately known as a steel can to us. It was designed as a permanent formwork and concrete anchorage. It consisted of six steel rings being N1 through to N6. Uh, what that meant was that we could conduct significant offsite production of the rings uh, and fabricate them, bring them to site, then carry out some on-site assembly uh, and detailed fabrication and installation. Uh, the ring dimensions are shown on there. Ring one and ring six were the heaviest at 27 tons and 33 tons, with ring six having a cast in concrete ring in the front of it uh, that was designed and built to marry up with ring one of precast rings for the TBM and then rings N2 to N5 being 20 tons each. Once installed and the grout bags inflated, that left a void to fill of 195 cubic metres. The weight of the steel can, the combined concrete and then the friction force against the shockcrete applied to build that launch at it would then be used as the reaction frame to shove the TBM off for launch. As you can see by these photos, the steel cans involved a lot of welding and a lot of lifting. They were delivered to site in quadrants, assembled together, uh, had an RMD system put in to stabilize them, and then they had straight welds applied across the quadrants before being lifted up and rotated into position to have the circumferential welds done. We did the initial build outside of our acoustic shed in daylight hours, then we moved them inside, rotated them, began doing the circumferential welds. We lifted ring six, ring four, five, ring two, three, and ring one down the hole, doing the circumferential welds between two, three, and four, five on the surface, and the remaining ones in the shaft as we pushed then the steel can into the launch at it.
once the steel can was in launch position, we then needed to install spoil bars, which stabilized the can into its position, surveyed its final position. Then we installed close-up ports, concrete ports, and closer eyes over those um, spud bars. So as I said, that's yet more welding that we needed to do. We then inflated the grout ceiling around the leading edge and trailing edge, which needed to be done over the course of a 10-hour fill to ensure that we adequately in inflated the bag and didn't move the steel can. And then we placed the 195 cubes of concrete to seal the can up. So a jump ahead to, to where we are now, uh, obviously with the TBM lowered uh, and pushed into the front, we've constructed the steel can, placed the concrete, removed those pieces. Gantries one and two have been lowered in, structurally assembled uh, and put together. So at the moment, we're in the last throes of installing, commissioning our services, umbilicals and launch support systems. Uh, but what does that look like? So in the photo on, on my left, we have our grout batching plant, which will provide the grout to the annulus of the TBM once she's mining. We have a air compressor system and a water cooling system, which is a bit unique to slurry machines as they require a lot more water and, and air to be able to power the, the and cool the slurry systems. The picture on the right then shows those services being sent across the top of the shaft on the capping beam and entering our service tower and running down the 65 metres to the bottom of the shaft. If you then look at these two pictures, the picture on the left, you can see the bottom of the service tower as it, it reaches the bottom of the shaft. And then in front of us, the back of gantry two and the Secatol remixer, which is used to house the grout remixing plant. On the right, as you can see, you've got main tunnel C reception at it and Ursula having broken through just last week, along with the starts of our umbilicals for the slurry system. So, uh, I think echoing something that Robbie said uh, earlier, uh, I am one one person in the face of this team, but there are a lot of engineers and operatives that work very hard to to bring Selena into sight and to to set her up. Uh, and we look forward to our ready to bore being in the not too distant future. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, so it's it's just for me to, to, to wrap up now for, for, for a few minutes. Um, yeah, thanks thanks very much for, for Robbie, for, for Mikel and Oscar, and um, to Shannon for the for the great presentations. Uh, and absolute credit to them for the for the work that them and, and their teams have been doing across those sites. You know, it, it, it's really stunning the work they're doing. Um, it, I, I never fail to be impressed by the technical challenges and the technical excellence that the teams are delivering. So you can see from Robbie the the, the problem solving. Uh, of a difficult challenge at Barn Elms, from Oscar and from um, Mikel, the, the the detailed technical work they've done on the compressed air interventions and the and the real focus on health and safety and getting that right, and then clearly from Shan and the scale of the of the work that's going on for the TBM launch, and I think you'll have seen through all the presentations a a, a, a real theme of uh, a focus on safety and health and keeping people uh, well at work, and a focus on looking at best practice and and looking at innovative ways to do what we've got to do. Uh, and um, you know, just as a reminder, all the work that you've seen tonight, um, the vast majority of that has happened through the COVID period. So the team will be dealing with that uh, as well. And, it, and it's great to see so many young engineers uh, doing excellent work across the program. Looking forward to, to next year then. So um, the civil engineering and tunneling work will, 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 will carry on. We've got the two TBM drives in East and then the secondary line in Western Central alongside finishing the uh, a number of the interception structures that connect to the Thames water sewers. We'll also be moving on to do some of the early mica and mechanical electrical installations and um, the early kind of worksite testing to start looking forward to the overall commissioning and completion and handover of the of the project. Uh, and for the first few months of next year, we're working ac across the whole project team, all organisations and stakeholders to get um, alignment and to finalise the programme from now till 2024 when we complete and get the systems really working to do the certification, acceptance and handover of the assets to make sure we're looking ahead to the end. But we'll only do any of that if we continue to get the really important things right, which is is the teamwork, the leadership, as, as, as everybody in the presentation has said so far, there's a great team of people doing some fantastic work and it's our duty to, to look after them and, and to lead those teams and to make sure the teams are supported to be able to do the work they do so well. Uh, a strong focus on health, safety and wellbeing and then getting the engineering, the planning, uh, the quality and the sustainability right. That's the, the, the focus for us for next year. And then just looking a little bit further ahead, uh, just a few pictures of what the project looked like when we have finished. 
So, you know, underground, the, the system will be doing what it does to keep the sewer, sewage out of the River Thames. Um, but on the surface, we'll be creating these new areas of public realm um, and leaving a, a lasting legacy for London, not just a cleaner river, but um, some great public spaces as well. So it just leads me to thank thank the, the team, um, thank the team for the presentation, but thank the team across the whole of Tideway. You, you know, I couldn't possibly get all the organisations, but we've got some great contractors, great designers, great um, specialist contractors across the whole project, and we wouldn't be able to do what we do with, without them. So you know, th thanks to everyone for the great work that, that you're all doing on, on the Tideway project. It is really appreciated. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you all. That was absolutely fantastic presentations. And I think if we could, let's go to some questions. Um, if um, in the normal way, hopefully we're all, all used to everything being on YouTube now, if you could put your questions in the chat and we will work our way through. I can see there's already, already a couple. Where do we start? Okay, um, if we want to take the first one, so question for Robbie. Did you have um, a contingency measure in case of ground instability during breakout in the ground before you were able to push the steel pipe forward? Dry hand spray. And this is from a Dr. Sauer and Partners engineer. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, yeah, so, uh, that's a very good question. Um, and it's something we did consider at length. It's, um, how do we get the? It's always it's difficult dealing with the crown of that pipe. You know, how how do we get it down and how do we close up as soon as possible? So we, the the sections that we separated the pipes into 625 millimeters, and we designed that hood that you, that I did I, that showed on the slides um, for our recovery shield to be 600 millimeters long as well. So before we we engage the the breaker of the brock to break that wedge out of the crown following the longitudinal cuts, we made sure we had a pipe at pit bottom and we were ready to push. So as soon as we broke the wedge and the, and the crown pieces came into the invert, we pushed immediately covering that ground. And I mean, we had um, we, we had done 30 meters of the, of the tunnel at that stage. And we, 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 had a reasonable, we had reasonable expectations of how the ground was going to react. Um, but yes, we, we, we didn't consider it necessary to have um, contingency measures um, once we we had the, the hood operating the way it was intended. Okay, I think we've got another next question in, I think is also yourself. Did you consider continuing with segmental build rather than pipe jack pipes? This is from Steve P. We did, yeah. Um, we did consider uh, building, building segments. Um, unfortunately, the the lead time for for, get, for getting the moulds made and the approval time and getting them all cast um, and delivered to size just to, they, that wasn't going to work for us. But um, our machine was designed to be, you know, there, there was the possibility there for us to change to a, a, a ring erector on the back of the back of our machine. But unfortunately, time didn't permit that that option. It would have been a good option, you know, had to be the time. And I think you've got another one. Um, the next one we've got then is from Shaney Wallace. Was pipe jacking necessary? Could it have been um, NATAM, which actually means SCL, um, for was it the 200 metres? Was the drive under the river with potential head? I mean, yeah, that's, a, that's another good question. And uh, I suppose the obvious thing that jumps to mind when you're looking at SCL is, is the cost. Um, it's substantially more expensive than than pipe jacking, but you were also generating a lot of dust, and it was a relatively small tunnel. I mean, the finished internal diameter of this connection tunnel is 2.2 meters. To to do this in SEO, you you'd have to be looking at you know um, a primary lining ID of at least uh, you know at least 3.94 meters, something like that. And that would we would have been dealing with a significant um, thickness of secondary lining then to if we were to maintain the 2.2 ID of the finished product. Um, so I can't speak to whether that was considered at the beginning of the project because I, I, was, I wasn't part of the project at that point. But um, 
Um, it's a it, it's a good question. Yeah, it's not a particularly long tunnel for SCL, but again, not not ideal for the sizes we're talking about. Okay, I think the next question we've got in is for Oscar and Mikkel. This comes in from Christina Smith. Did you consider saturation interventions rather than lots of short ones? Uh, good question. Uh, no, we didn't. We didn't. Uh, the saturation intervention requires a lot of uh, uh, big setup on on site. Uh, uh, we were quite uh, limited in space, uh, very restrained, and no. And the answer is is not. No, we didn't. We'll see if we've got a couple of more questions coming in. I think just trying to make sure we've captured everything. So I guess probably whilst we're waiting to see if there's any more questions that come in on the chat, probably um, one from me, sort of, is there anything sort of since your time on Tideway across all the different things you've learned and the challenge you've overcome that you would look at have done done differently? And I think some of that kind of has come out in any of the, the questions that have been asked. I think I think Kate Kate for me, um it, and it was something that we that we've dealt with a, a few years ago, but there was a there was a couple of um, shafts, the shaft at Blackfriars and the shaft at King Edward Memorial Park, where the original design had the, the tunnel going through online through the through the base of the shaft. And in one case, the ground conditions for the shaft sinking were more challenging than expected, and the other had um, some massive protection work that was more challenging than, than expected. Um, and we ended up um, redesigning to realign the, the tunnel offline from the main shaft so that we could sink the shaft offline from the tunnels. Um, you know, to, to to protect the overall critical path, and it and and it worked, and it, and it's worked in both cases really well. So I think in in future, probably you know, looking at the risks of the things on online of the TBM to see actually, is it better to have tunnels offline, and and also allowing the the consents, um, you know, the um the overall con consent in in our case development consent order, given the flexibility to make those changes when you do come across challenges out in the field, you need to have the flexibility to come up with those engineering solutions and make them work. So, so I'd say that that was the kind of biggest lesson learned for, for me from the project, which is you know, sim similar to some lessons on, on other projects. But um, yeah, I, I can certainly um, correlate. I think the, the impact of a DCO and obviously on such a big project, having such a large DCO and sort of leading the way with so much of it. Um, I can see there's been lots that's been learned from that. So it's Okay. I particularly liked also that you shared at the beginning the um, the readiness reviews, which quite interestingly wasn't just kind of construction focus and actually a really key one in there that stood out for me was that that also covered things like consents and sort of showed how how important some of that was also to the delivery of this project and linking yeah. everything together. Absolutely. And, and using that as an opportunity to make sure, you know, everything that we need is, is, in, is in good shape before we start work and, and, and very much a team effort. Yeah, I think for me, I was, I was going to mention um, when we draw to a close, but the importance of, of teamwork and how strong all the teams are really comes through. And it's been fantastic to see tonight. Um, just something, if, if I could add on that, sorry, Kate, just to back yeah, up what Andy did. I mean, as I said in my presentation, the, the, the consultation period um, for the consenting process with the, the river regulators started, you know, many, many, many months into last year um, for such a big thing. And, and uh, you know, I, I could have done a presentation completely on just that entire process alone. Um, I lost many nights of sleep trying to get things done with it. Um, one of our consenting managers due to COVID had to move back to uh, New Zealand to get a new visa and was still there trying to manage the consent. So, I mean, it, it's a very important process that I think every contractor has played a lot of 
a lot of homage to in, in the works we do. No, I think absolutely. I think it's, it's, it's good to see. And I think it's definitely been a, a big thing that I think has been even more understood from, from the delivery of this project. And I can see though, we've got a few couple more questions that have um, coming in. Um, many European engineers on the project, what happens on the 1st of Jan? Uh, I, I think we, we, we carry on as, as as we are in December. I think, you know, there's a, this Brexit's been long enough coming. I think everyone knows what, what needs to be done to, to secure people being able to work in the UK. We, we are absolutely, um, you know, absolutely, absolutely dependent and, and, and value the, the skills and experience that, that our European colleagues bring to the project. And, um, and you know, it, 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 you know it's, a, it's a fantastic team from across the globe and, and that team will still be in place on the 1st of January. So I think then the next one we've got is, um, I think when we've got one from Gary Vickerman. Um, sorry, move it back down again. Um, what sort of checking forces did you experience during drive and what was the plan if they began to exceed what was permissible? Yeah, um, thanks for that, Kerry. It's well spotted. We did have, um, I mean, we we did exceed permissible jacking load. Um, the jacking load that was about 800 tonnes was the, was the maximum we, we experienced. And originally the limit was set as 440 tons. So there was a, per a period uh, during the drive or continuing the drive where you know, we were in constant daily discussions with the designers of what that meant for the, the primary line because we were, we were experiencing those loads at our main jacking rig. Um, uh, we, everybody knew that the only way to finish it was to, to keep the pipeline moving. That if any downtime at all was just going to increase the jacking loads, as I'm sure you'd, you'd appreciate. Um, so it was a, a collaborative effort with the with the designers to try and get us to a position where we we knew that we were not going to detrimentally affect the primary lining of our shaft and also get the get the drive done. So uh, in answer, 800 tons of the max um, initial limit of 440. But um, since completing the drive, we have been able to to prove that we didn't detrimentally affect the 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 design of our shaft um, as a result of the jacking forces. Just see if we've got a couple more questions coming in. So I guess probably whilst we're waiting for some others, um, it's probably sort of whether there's any particular personal highlights that each of you wanted to share of your each of your key things that you've learned and would take away your next one. I'm, I'm guessing you'll all have quite varied ones. Want us to start, Robbie, Robbie. Do you want to start? Sure. Uh, I, I remember um, when, when we were looking at this problem in, in February. As I mentioned, I, I arrived a week after this. The, the connection tunnel had stopped, and I mean, it's a pretty dire situation to be in with cracked pipes and no way forward, and uh, particularly tricky, tricky job ahead. And um, I remember when we were developing the the, the the strategy for removing these pipes, we. We were very much focused on just getting to the TEM, remove these pipes, replace them with compliant pipes, get to our machine and try to launch it. But I, I, I do remember the the relief. There was I didn't I didn't feel like we were under pressure, or me personally, whether I was under pressure. Um, but there was a, a serious sense of relief when we managed to dock that steel lead pipe into the back of the TEM and relaunch. It was um, I, I'll, I'll remember that day for for a few more months at least. Oscar and Mikel, do you want to go next? Yes, we presented the, the best practice we implemented in, in Black Friars to test all our 
systems and also to to learn that those lessons were key and definitely we recommend to implement those kind of practice to test all the all the equipment with the TVM on the ground because there are always uh, there's always room to to improve uh, those systems yeah and, and Shannon uh, I, I definitely have to say it's uh, the, the delivery of the TBM um, on the Skylift. Uh, I, certainly not something I, I'd ever dreamed in my early career that I'd ever ever be part of. Um, sort of a number of firsts with that being, you know, um, jacking a, a, a barge, a jack-up barge into into central London and driving a TBM off. Um, and certainly just the, just the amount of work that goes into something like that. Um, yeah, I, I, for me, that's probably the biggest highlight and will probably be potentially my biggest highlight of my career to date. So, um, and just, just how much I appreciate having had that opportunity to do it. And I think for me, Kate, I mean, there's loads of sort of technical highlights, the, the TBM delivery coming up the river, the TBM breakthroughs, the, the connection tunnel mining, and when that first got to the back of the main tunnel. So there's some some great technical highlights, but but actually the, the, the major highlight for me is the whole team. You know, every, every day you, you you, you engage with people from across the job from different backgrounds who are doing fantastic work, whether that's reviewing a, the kind of engineering and a Reddit review or, or being out on site, um, talking to people about the work they're doing. You know, we've got such a great team. Um, and, and, and that for me is the, the real highlight of the job. I think that that comes through in, in spades as well, I would say. I think the, the team team effort and the team spirit is definitely very apparent. And I think probably another question from me, I think we're not sure if we've got any more yet on the chat, um, but it, it's probably about sort of how important the the river has been actually in terms of logistics. I mean, the some of the photographs of what you're seeing in terms of what's been achieved, I mean, it, it's not something that's been seen on the scale before. The river is incredibly important to London, but I think in terms of how we've really excelled in bringing a marine and a tunneling environment together has been really important and just really interesting and fascinating to see about how those logistics gel with the logistics that we're used to and I mean some of the the stats that you were mentioning at the, the beginning about how many vehicles we've taken off the road is really quite significant. Yeah definitely and I, I think there's a, a presentation in its own right on the on the marine side of the, of the Taiwan project that we need to, to organise. Um, the, the, the temporary works to start with, so a number of the sites we need to build out into the river, so building the coffer dams to, to create the space. The, the marine engineering that went into that was, was technically really interesting, very complex in places, um, and, and as you said, done on a scale that's not been seen um, on the River Thames ever. Um, yeah, so some major marine temporary works gone in. And then the, the logistics was, there's a bit of a kind of story and a bit of a journey we've been through there. So right at the start um the tunneling sites are on the river so that you can use marine logistics for the kind of heavy stuff the excavating material and that was the sort of starting point but but we came to the project um and a, and a number of people with certainly very strong leadership from the the Taiwan client who you know is when we talk about the team the, the Taiwan client is a is a fantastic client to work with you know very very driven by health safety well-being looking after people doing the right thing um uh, you know, a really, really good forward-looking client to work with, and and the client have very strong drive to take as much um, logistics off of the road as we as we can, from a from a health and safety and a sustainability point of view. So that then led to segments going by by river. It led to marine um, temporary works going by river, equipment being delivered by river, and worked with across the three contracts for what was called the more by river piece of work, which is where we looked at what what more can we get on the river, and let's do that. Um, and the, and the client funded that to happen, which was, you know, as I say, really forward looking. Uh, and then the other thing the client has done very early stages was set up the, the marine um, safety side of things. So it obviously is a lot of additional work on the river compared to anything that's been done before. And the client set up um, the framework for marine safety requirements, the, the marine training. There's a simulator at HR Wallingford where the, the marine tug operators go to to to, to validate their, um, their, their their competence in driving the tug uh, and dealing with emergency situations, so to, to, to make sure we've got a really good good competence um, in in the marine crews and to help to build that competence, 
Uh, and then we have a marine safety forum, for example, the same as we have a normal health and safety forum to make sure we're driving best practice through through the marine works as well as the civil engineering works. So it's 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 a great part of the project and and, a, and another really interesting part of the project. Okay, let's see. I think. I think we've got another one in which probably links into the, the same subject um, from Dr. Sauer and Partners Engineer. Was road delivery of the TBM in pieces not considered? Does everything have to come on the river? It, 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 for, the, for, those, for, the, um, for, for the for the Greenwich TBM, which is there's no sensible river access for the Greenwich TBM that's coming by by road and the Frogmore TBM, which is a small one. But the the four main TBMs, because the sites are on the river, then then the default was we're going to use the river to bring um, the TBMs in because it was it it was safe considered to be safer uh, and probably more cost effective because we can do it in in larger pieces rather than than smaller pieces. So I think it is a a, a, a good solution all round. Mm, that's good. And I think just to, we'll give it a, a couple more minutes on the the chat, but. Probably for me, on a on a similar light, you shared your sort of each of your personal highlights. But if if someone was telling you they were wanting to do something similar, whether in the UK or overseas, what would be the number one thing you would recommend that they they did? Because there's been so many things learned on a, a program of this size. I I think, and and I and I now I appreciate both of these. It, it's 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 not simple. There's a lot of um, complexity and, com and competing factors. But for me, I think the two things are one is the, the consenting arrangements. You know, when you're going to get the development consent order or, or any other consent, yes, there's there's a lot of um, concessions need to be made to get agreement to proceed with the scheme. But I think doing that, but but bearing in mind the construction challenges and and the constructability needs. So that you've got a consenting um, uh, vehicle that allows you to to be efficient in construction and to implement good ideas to give you that flexibility to do that, I think is is really important and to give enough space and flexibility for the construction from work. So I think that's number one. Uh, and I think from a um, procurement side of things, yeah, Tideway has been procured as a as a NEC um, target C uh, NEC um, option C target price contract. It's been very, very collaborative. There's been a few um, challenges along the way that, that we've that we've worked through from you know kind of change under the under the contracts, but I think the the project 13 approach of um, uh, you know kind of future looking procurement of projects following a, a project 13 approach I think would have um, merit in, in big schemes like this in terms of looking looking hard at the risk allocation um, uh, across the project so that the that everybody can focus on the delivery side, uh, and and um, yeah, doesn't doesn't need so much leadership attention on the on the commercial side. Okay. And what about what about the rest of you? Well, I mean, case I'm I'm just I'm very impressed with how young a lot of the people at Mise and Tide are, you know, um, and it's it's kind of if you want to do something in another country or if another country was considering doing something like this let's say get a good get a good run of major infrastructure projects in the pipeline to keep these people you know um, like I can speak personally of the team we have here at Burn Arms is the, they put put a, 20, a 23 year old me to shame you know with their ability and um, I've always been very impressed so I mean from a selfish point of view in the UK we should try to keep these people but if you're doing something like this and another country is looking at it just get a good pipeline of, of major infrastructure projects and try to keep a hold of these people anyone else wish to share some of the things yeah I, I think um, from my my point, it's 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 have an open mind um, and be prepared to to step outside of your comfort zone um, if 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 you can. Um, sort of echoing again Robbie's comments, you know, people being young. I consider myself still quite young, and I'm only only 35, but I've got a lot of varied experience here in the UK, um, having moved here when I was 27 from Australia. 
Um, and, you know, if I do ever eventually return to Australia, there'll be so much experience that I've, I've gained here that I'll take back with me. Um, and equally, I'd say to, to young engineers here, if the opportunity for them to, to go overseas presents itself, um, take it. Um, because you know you'll never you'll never look backwards with with the kind of experience you could gain in North America or or out in Oceania or in the Middle East or or in Southeast Asia. So. Yeah, that's that's great. So I think I think we're probably probably drawing to a close with questions that we've got in the chat. Um, I think if there are any more questions that come in. I'm sure the speakers from tonight will will not mind if we will be able to pass them on to them if there are any particular ones. But really wanted to take this opportunity um, to say how delighted I am that we're able to have you back again this year. And I think I want to already book you in to come and give us another update um, next year, if that's still OK. Sure. I think every every year and I think every time we hear things from this project there's so much great stuff that is happening and I think the the teamwork the enthusiasm and the significant challenges that you're overcoming is really great to see and I think we could we could have you coming really quite regularly for the amount that you have to share so please um keep keep us in mind and and let's find some time to get you back again next year um and yeah and I think for me really seeing that teamwork and problem solving and also hearing about the good work of particularly um, younger engineers across the whole program and the opportunities that are there for all is also really great to see. So keep up the good work and we'll welcome you back next year.